Hello, everybody. My name is George Hurricane, and I'm very, very excited to be here with you today, albeit it is in a virtual fashion, you know, considering the circumstances. But I'm very excited to be talking to you about the three artifacts to manage your metadata and reference data. So, as I mentioned, my name is George Hurricane. Really quickly about myself. I've been doing this for more than 10 years now, been really a data governance practitioner. I'm currently the Director of Data Governance and Business Intelligence within the University of British Columbia. But if you don't know me already, I can tell you that I'm really just exuberant about data governance and data management in general. So that's one of the reasons why I'm a frequent speaker and writer, contributor, YouTuber. As much as possible, I do try to provide practical information to just help you with any data governance and data management questions and challenges. So please check out lightsondata.com. A lot of great articles there and templates and even online courses. Or if you prefer content in video format, please check out my YouTube channel where I post a video each week. Or just follow me on LinkedIn. I promise you will not be disappointed. And yes, as I mentioned, I do have a, a few courses three of which you can see right here, one on learning how to create an award-winning business glossary, everything that you do need to know on data governance maturity models, and my latest one with Donabel Santos on data visualization for data storytelling. But don't forget to get in touch with me and just connect with me on LinkedIn. I really always enjoy meeting new people in person or online and just listening to your feedback and sharing ideas and information. So please, please do get in touch with me. Now, on to our today's session. The reality is that there's really an ocean of data out there. And no, I'm not referring to data lakes. What I mean by an ocean of data is that really regardless of the organization size, regardless of the size of the database or databases, we are all confronted with a lot of challenges when it comes to data, especially when it comes to metadata. And these challenges are some of the impediments of becoming a data-driven organization. We hear that a lot. We need to become more data-driven. Well, we need to find different ways to navigate this ocean successfully and discover as much as we can and as much as we need to in order to answer questions to give us insight, hindsight, and foresight. Because we need to conduct the strategical as well as the operational objectives as best as possible. So that's really why we have all these data management areas and data governance. Now, there are these three artifacts, these three artifacts that will help an organization really navigate this ocean of data, this ocean of questions and answers on data integrations, reports and dashboards, master data management, reference data management, data analytics, data governance, etc. just a little bit better. So that's what we are going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what each one of these items are, these three artifacts, business glossary, data dictionary, and data catalog, how they differ from one another, what are some of their benefits, and how they interact with each other. So a lot of a lot of great stuff there. And by the way, if you are confused about these three, it's normal because there are a lot of very different similarities, diff different similar terms that we can find out there. And sometimes they are used interchangeably in a wrongly fashion, especially by some of the people providing, you know, different products that would solve your problems. So it's it's very, very normal for you to be confused. We're not going to go over each one of these, what they are and how they differ. But what I can tell you again is that these three you will encounter them the most often and know they don't mean the same thing. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the business glossary. Now, here's the reality. Making assumptions, making assumptions on meanings of business terms, such as what's customer, what's a citizen, sale conversion rate, credit, GPA, you name it is really what creates challenges in the workplace. I remember this one story. It's my story, and that's why I remember it. But it was 
I was I was uh, interviewing for a technical job in a nonprofit organization for which its main business role was fundraising. When I was inquiring more about the teams that I would be working with in my role, the interviewer told me that they have about 200 people working in development. And now because I was coming from a software development background, my immediate reaction was, wow, okay, 200 people working in development, in software development, that's a big team. I mean, I knew that it was a big organization, but I couldn't imagine they had such a huge team. Well, from the context of the conversation of the interview, I realized that development was really a synonym for fundraising teams. So they had 200 or so people working in a fundraising capacity, not in a software development capacity. Now, the message here is that wrong assumptions happen. And meanings of business terms are not always known, especially when you're entering a new industry, but also when you're switching organizations or even offices, departments. So what is this business glossary? It's just a collection of business terms with their unique definitions and other related information. And there are three keywords here that I want you to focus on business, unique, and information. So really we're talking about the business metadata, the business terms, business language, business verbiage, you know, whatever synonym you want to use. We're talking about having this commonplace, this trusted source of information where anyone can just go to and understand the business terminologies and even other relevant information about these terms that just provides us more context on, especially on their usage. Now, I think we're, we're all somewhat familiar with business glossary because we encounter them in reports, documents, books, manuals, and it looks something like this, usually towards the end. But the reality is that it's so much more than that. Regardless if it's spring or summer, autumn, winter, I really feel like it's Christmas, regardless of the season. It's that gift that keeps on giving. There's so much more that business glossaries can provide. So let me give you a couple of examples. So as I mentioned, a business glossary holds definitions of business concepts and its related semantics, its ontology, its meaning. And a business glossary is comprised of terms, the business concepts, and really other information. And let me just zoom in here a little bit to try and give you this example here. If I don't know if you can see it very well. We're looking at this term that's called email address. Obviously it can be any other one, but I try to make it as relevant as possible to anybody that's watching this. And we have the definition underneath, but then we have all these other attributes and they can vary in terms of the number of attributes that you want to hold. But you can have things such as taxonomy, the business units that are responsible or the office responsible for it. What's the, the ownership, the data curator, status, acronym, abbreviation, synonym, you know, providing some examples, usage descriptions, um, any any notes, any policies, any security standards that you want to relate this one to. And of course, you could also hook it up to some IT assets as well. All right. Now, to be at its most effective, a business glossary must also be readily and easily accessible within your organization. And not only that, but we need to remember that it's business owned. It's business language, which is controlled and updated by the business. Although facilitating the updates and management of the business glossary itself, the tool often falls on the data governance organization or within IT or operations, depending how you're structured. But it's a tool. It's a great tool that enables clear communications with, within your organization, within your office, within the enterprise between IT and the business and even with regulators. And now we're, we're already jumping into the benefits here and there are a lot of benefits. I'm only going to touch on three of them, but it does improve communication. As I mentioned, we all come in with all these assumptions based on our life and work experience. And we tend to just bring them into the workplace without always validating them. So it does enable that 
consistent communication between business unit. And I think the, the term really customer is the perfect example for this because most of the time it doesn't mean the same thing as it does for you know, procurement, um, between that and supply chain management, sales, marketing, IT. All of these would have different interpretations of what that word is. And I'm sure that you have at least one business term that you can think of that you always have conversations about. You're always coming with all these assumptions and it doesn't mean the same thing as it does to that person next to you. I'm sure of it. It happens so many, so many times. Too many times even. But obviously, we must strive to use the same glossary as much as possible and same terminology. Because reality is that using the same terms for the same things is really hard enough inside the organization. But obviously, it doesn't stop there. With the rise of the entire digital transformation, we, as well as our machines that we're working with, will increasingly communicate with business partners in the business ecosystem. So yes, we must strive to use the same glossary or at least know how different business glossaries map with each other. And this starts with knowing your own. So that's a big, big benefit. Also establish that ownership. It's let's say um, a very wanted side effect of having and establishing a business glossary, the fact that it creates ownership. And it's really the individual or the unit, but most likely the individual, and needs to approve this. Somebody needs to get a sign off when the definition is in place and whenever any changes to its attributes need to, to occur. That can also connect with the data stewardship, but it does create that ownership. It does create it when it's being built. And this also creates engagement because people tend to be more engaged when they have responsibility over something. I hope you, you can agree on that one. It also improves productivity as well as the timeliness of decision-making process. Now, you, you would definitely have faster development of uh, you know dashboards and reports. Not necessarily the written reports, but reports that are based on data. So why is that a case? If you've ever worked with a business intelligence team or an IT team that had to develop these dashboards, these reports for you, or maybe you are one of uh, the members of that team, you know that there's quite a hefty cycle to create them because there are so many conversations that need to happen on the definitions on what goes into those reports. And what do you mean by this column? How should it be calculated? How should it be interpreted? What is the context? What is the definition? What about here? What about the second page? Should it be the same? There's a lot of conversations about the meanings of things. And if you're lucky, at the end of the project or throughout it, you would have documentation that's created that would capture all of this. But even if you're lucky, you, most of the time, those get captured in emails or maybe some meeting notes from all these meetings that you were part of where these decisions were made. And maybe a year later, when a similar report needs to be put together, developed, well, if the same people aren't there anymore, and even if they are, you forget after 12 months. And you start making assumptions again, or you start going through the same conversations, same hefty number of meetings and hours that you have to spend in closed doors and come to a conclusion. Not if you have a business glossary. Now you have this curated, trusted source that's centralized. You know it's being managed. You know, again, it's being curated. You trust it. You refer to it. If a change needs to occur, you go through the proper change management process and change it for everybody as well, if that needs to occur. But overall, it does improve productivity. The business intelligence teams, the IT teams see a lot of productivity, a lot of time saved just by having this clarity in place. So that's what the business glossary is. Let's step on to the data dictionary. Now, that's maybe on the other side of the spectrum. We talked about the business metadata. This is more on the technical metadata. It gives you the, it's basically a repository of information about data that provides the description of data elements as well as its metadata. And I think, again, the easiest way is to take a look at example of what you see here on the left-hand side. Let me make this one bigger. There you go.
And by the way, I'm trying to be very tool agnostic in my presentation. So that's why you're seeing maybe these in a more plain fashion. If you were to have a tool, it would look a little bit fancier than this, but that's basically really what it would capture. This is again, just an example. So you think you see things such as data type, size, allowed values, default values, constraints, relationships to other data elements, and sometimes even meaning and purpose of the data set in each field. So a little bit of an overlap with a business glossary, but the business glossary is the business term as a whole. The data dictionary captures that term in that table for this context. It's a little bit more specific and a lot more technical. Now, that being said, the data dictionary and the business glossary, they do talk to one another quite a bit for the most part. Sometimes organization just choose to um, merge them into one. And depending how you want to tackle it, it can be done. So, so the data dictionary provides a very application or technology centric view of the data. It provides the description of a data element and its metadata, as I mentioned. And you can have many data dictionaries, one for each application or system. But for the business glossary, because I, I haven't um, mentioned that before, usually just have one for the entire organization. Now, there's also the concept of a passive data dictionary and an active data dictionary, which I won't cover now because it's not in the, the focus of this session. Uh, all, all I'll have to say, though, is that when a passive data dictionary is updated, it's done so manually and independently from any changes to the database structure. With the active data dictionary, it's kind of the other way around. The dictionary is updated first, and changes occur in the database structure automatically as a result. Now, the benefits of the data dictionary. And again, I'll keep it to three. Now, whenever developers need to program anything that has to do with capturing or consuming data, such as a web form or a piece of software or a dashboard or a report, it's really very useful to understand the technical metadata behind the data elements. And that's one of its main benefits. It really clarifies those business and technical requirements. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say you are a developer, you're uh, developing a web form to capture a customer name and you should definitely know with what, what the technical metadata should be used so that that it doesn't really have any unwanted repercussions. Um, why? Maybe you are designing it to be a, a field a var char of maximum 32 characters, but the database that's storing it, it's only 16 characters, the uh, that var char field. Once that happens, you'll obviously run into issues because anything that's bigger than 16 characters that's captured by the form, it will be truncated and you might not even know about it for a long time. So it's also forcing the programmer to also ask those questions from the business analyst, technical analyst, whoever they're working with, if they haven't thought of it already. So it does create some consistency in data use. It also accelerates training because ask any developer who recently joined an organization, the hard part about learning their new stack, it's not really deciphering the code itself. Well, sometimes it is, but it's really more about bringing context to it. There's really a reason why it takes several months for any technical hire to be fully ramped up on their new companies, you know, CRM, ERP, CMS, whatever big system you have in place. And database documentation is definitely critical in getting your technical and often more costly technical employees up to speed as quickly as possible on the application that they're maintaining or building. And lastly, at least as the third benefit, it does improve master data management and as a result, also reference data management. And this is really especially true when handling the integration of databases that don't share the same vocabulary, but they do share similar data. Such as whenever you're inheriting, let's say, a CRM or a database of another office or another organization or company during an acquisition or merger, or you just want to create a new business relationship between them. 
But you know, not only that, anything that really has to do with master data and reference data, it does help. It creates those efficiencies. So that's what the, the data dictionary is. On to our last one, the data catalog. And I think the easiest ways to understand the catalog's purpose, the data catalog's purpose, it's kind of think back of whenever we used to have those product catalogs, and maybe we still do, right? For IKEA, you kind of flip through. The only thing we don't do right now, we don't order from the catalog. But back in the day, you kind of pick and choose whatever you want to order. You mail it in with your check, cash, what have you. And a few weeks or months later, that item would arrive. Well, now we kind of have something similar, but a lot more, a lot more improved. Uh, the catalog 2.0 or 20.0, we have things like Amazon. Amazon is really a good example of an online catalog. And Amazon carries millions of different products. And yet, as consumers, we find almost anything fairly quickly. So for example, I want to find a book about moving abroad. I'm putting that into the search box. I see all these books. I click on something that is relevant or it's deemed to be relevant for me. And I see all this other very interesting metadata such as, there you go. We see things such as, where are you? Oh, okay. Um, you know, different ratings from other customers. We can see the type of book. Is it paperback? Is it electronic? Is it, you know, glossy cover? All these that are similar um, items and a bunch of other metadata from you know, who was the publisher, publisher, how many pages does it have, what's the weight, so forth and so on. Now, data catalogs, believe it or not, really work in the same way for your databases, but they can be also used for any data lake or data warehouse, any, any data store, really. So a data catalog is an enterprise-wide asset that's providing a single reference source for the location of any data set required for varying needs. Needs such as, you know, operational, business intelligence, analytics, data science, AI, so forth and so on. The purpose of the data catalog is really just to organize the thousands or millions of an organization's data sets to help the users perform searches for specific data and understand its metadata as well as data lineage, uses, and even how others perceive the data's value. It's really this single point directory that offers the user the ability to locate information and further provides a mapping between the business uh, glossary and the data dictionary. Um, and we don't have time to do this right now, but I do encourage you to check out data.gov. This is the US government's open data. And it's a great example or a good example of a data catalog that you can find and implement. So a lot of benefits there. It does support regulatory compliance because all of a sudden you know what type of data is where. It does foster that data culture because it can facilitate frictionless discoverability. Now you are you are empowered to find out whatever data you could use for whatever project. And it also increases trust. You know the data sets that have been added in here are curated. Kind of similar to how artworks are displayed in a museum. You know, they're being cleaned. You have the description at the bottom on that plaque. You know, somebody went through the work to really explain it and what, what it is about. And it's in a stage and state that can be consumed. And similar for your, your data catalog. So what's the relationship between all of these? Well, on the left, we have the databases, which are being ingested into the data dictionary. And they get surfaced into the data catalog. So all that technical metadata can be found or at least referenced from the data catalog itself. And the business glossary can also go between uh, all, th all um, both of them, actually, the data dictionary and the data catalog. So there you have it. We have the business glossary, data dictionary, and data catalog. Remember that ideally you should only have one business glossary, one data catalog, and you can also have multiple data dictionary, one for each system. So I do hope that you do have a better understanding what the differences are between the three artifacts, and then you'll be able to implement all three and just navigate this ocean of data and metadata and reference data a lot better. Now, don't forget to get in touch with me and connect with me on LinkedIn. I always enjoy meeting new people, as I mentioned, in person 
or online. So thank you so much. It was a really a pleasure to be here virtually with you. Thank you.